There are so many options out there for investors, stocks, bonds, real estate. What do you choose? Well, our guest today might help you in making that decision. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Mike Larson serves as vice president and editor-in-chief at Money Show, overseeing all aspects of its investor education efforts and conferences. Before joining Money Show, he was a senior editor and analyst at Weiss Ratings and also worked at Bankrate.com and Bloomberg News. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. Mike, welcome. Hey, glad I could be here. Great, great that it worked out. Yeah, I've been kind of following you for a while since you were a writer. Where, where were you a writer again? Gosh, I, you know, I started out out of college at Bankrate.com. It used to be old Bankrate monitors. So I was writing about interest rates and, and personal finance, mortgage advice, and so on. Back then, I wrote a column about where rates are going to go and why we think this is going to happen and so on and so forth. Uh, and then I started with a company called Weiss Research, Weiss Ratings, uh, investment newsletter publisher back in 2001. I had been there for a couple of decades, actually, covering uh, you know, trading, uh, recommendations, options, stocks, bonds, a little bit of everything, and also kind of analyzing the, the real estate markets we had a part of the business that was you know going responsible for going out there and not just saying buy this or sell that in the newsletters but also give sort of big macro perspective so i i had a lot to say on real estate and kind of the housing bubble we had back in the early two and mid 2000s and i've been now with money show um since about october of 2022 i used to go and present at their events uh when i was with weiss as as talking to our subscribers and investors and so on. Uh, and it's just kind of a natural fit. I always like getting out from behind the computer and talking to people, talking to individual investors, seeing what's on their mind and so on. Uh, and, and that's how I, I landed here in the end. <laughs> okay. Yes, it was wise. It was wise raisings. I, I followed them a lot during, during the crazy times. Of <laughs> that was 2008, right? You were there during the downturn. Yeah. Yeah. During the, the upturn and the downturn. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> All right. So here we are. Uh, oh, gosh, what is it? 16 years later from all of that. Um, what are you seeing out there? There's so many different opinions as to what these rate hikes mean, when a recession will come. Most economists have been very wrong about that. The Fed has been wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, where are we now um, considering the massive rate hikes and and the fight against inflation. Yeah, it's great you bring that up. I mean, the, the Fed's forecasting has been a little suspect. I mean, you and I remember the whole uh, well-contained subprime mortgage problems back in the, the mid-2000s and how that wasn't very well-contained at all. And then, of course, the Fed this time around, uh, you know, I, for one of the presentations, I guess it was about two, two and a half years ago, I remember pulling some quotes from Jay Powell, you know, we're not thinking about raising rates. We're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. And then, you know, we have the most aggressive rate hiking cycle in decades. Uh, it's been It's been a journey, that's for sure. I think, you know, you're in an environment now where the, the Fed is, is, I think, very comfortable with staying on pause or easing slightly for the rest of this year. It seems like they probably wanted to do a little bit more. I think if Powell and crew had gotten kind of the numbers they were looking for on the inflation front, they'd probably have already cut by now, or if not, they, they would have in June. But now we're kind of, you know, they're, they're sort of between a rock and a hard place. They want to cut. They think the economy is coming off the boil. But until they get those numbers um, on the inflation score, they kind of give them political cover, or economic cover for that matter. I think we're probably just going to be kind of in an environment where the Fed sits on his hands. And since you used to cover mortgage rates, there's the big question, where do you think mortgage rates are headed, which many people I think know now because they listen to me that they're <laughs> um, sort of indirectly related to what the Fed's doing, but not totally, you know, more, more connected to the 10-year treasury. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that was one of those things that I'd have to write when I, when I did work at Bankrate.com all those years ago. It was always like, you know, we'd have people say, oh, well, the Fed just cut rates. Why didn't mortgage rates go down 25 points? It's like, well, no, it's the bond market. It's this and MBS and all, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I think we're in an environment where, you know, the, the long end of the, the yield curve is really, it's, you know, it, bond investors are looking at the, the same information the Fed is in terms of, of uh, inflation and so on. And they're not willing to, to price in much future easing and kind of a, a cooling in inflation until they really get the proof in, you know, that that's going to happen. So I think we're in an environment where mortgage rates, you know, I, I don't think we're going to spike anytime soon. I, would, I think, you know, I look at it when it comes to the Fed, for example, that they're 
hurdle for cutting rates is a lot lower than their hurdle for restarting rate hikes, right? So I think the the possibility that mortgage rates just take off from here on the expectation inflation is going to blow out and the Fed's going to start hiking again and so on and so forth, I find that pretty uh, you know unlikely. And I think we're we're more likely in a scenario where rates are kind of in that flattish area to gently trending downward uh, again on the thirty year when you talk about that part of the mortgage curve. Yeah, if I were just if I were to describe how I see the economy right now, it's kind of like I'm from California, so I can say this. It's kind of like we just had a big earthquake and everyone's just like, is there going to be another one? <laughs> is there an aftershock coming? Where where are we? So I just feel like we're in this hold just hold it right here and see let, let's see if we could just hold things steady for a bit. Um because you know, we did go through a pretty major earthquake in the economy with with COVID. Yeah. I mean, what a swing, right? Yeah. Unprecedented where uh, nobody was working and then suddenly people are getting their jobs back and those, the data is all skewed because, Hey, is it just people take getting their jobs back? That's creating all this job growth or is it actually job growth? And I, you know, I hear some economists saying, no, no, it's just people getting their jobs back and we're there. So hopefully things will calm down after this. We shall see. But with that said, There's always opportunity. And since I'm so excited to be joining you guys at the Money Show, um, actually in in the San Francisco Bay Area coming up, um, tell, tell us a little bit about that because you're not usually in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm thrilled you're going to be there. It, it's the Investment Master Symposium. We're going to be May 7th to 9th, so kind of right around the corner here in Burlingame at the, the Hyatt Regency there by the airport. And we try and have a program that has a little bit of everything. You know, we've got real estate, we've got stocks, we've got bonds, we've got alternatives. It's kind of a 360 degree uh, perspective on what's going on out there and, and where investors have opportunity. I, it's interesting. I, again, I used to present at money shows in San Francisco back pre-pandemic with my old company. And this is the first time we've been back in the Bay Area since then, since 2019. So uh, it's going to be great to be back sort of a, you know, a new venue, but old location. And I think it, it's, a, it's a great, you know, it's a really interesting time for real estate markets in California, for what's going on in the tech sector. I mean, obviously, Obviously, the Bay Area is tied to tech and the fortunes there uh, and what's happening, you know, in the growth outlook and hiring and so on. So there's a lot of things coming together at this point in time that I think make this a really interesting time for investors who have real estate exposure to kind of look at if there's any adjustments they want to make. And also, if they're not involved, look at ways that they can maybe take advantage of some of the value created uh, by the run up in interest rates and by some of the selling we've seen as a result of that. Yeah, of course I'm I'm all in in real estate, but I know that it's it's probably very wise to <laughs> diversify. Um, so, are there other based on what you've seen? Are there other opportunities that give the kind of tax benefits that one can get through real estate? No, I mean, you know, that that is always going to be something that makes real estate a favored type of investment. Uh, You know, you you get those benefits. The government wants to give you benefits for being in certain types of investments. You see it in some of our speakers talk about direct oil drilling, for example, and the tax benefits that are involved there. Uh, You have them, obviously, in real estate. And I think in this environment, that's very important to keep in mind. That's a big part of your decision. And I think, again, we've had this environment, uh, this, this sort of macro thing where we've had the rate shock. We've had the real estate markets react. We've had obvious problems people talk about in in commercial real estate, you know, with with the the office, you know, work from home environment and some of the things that have happened in retail. So you've got some of these commercial real estate things going on. On the residential side, I think one of the issues is just that, again, it's a you know, we've had a market that to some degree has been locked up, right? There's some of us, uh, I'm going to raise my hand there and say, who, who were able to refinance and lock in at very low rates um, before, you know, rates shot up. And it, it's one of those things where if it's your primary residence or you, know, you have a locked in rate on investment property, people are reluctant to let that go, right? Um, so that's kind of created in the existing home market, I think, uh, an issue where there's not as much inventory as there would be uh, otherwise if we hadn't had such a rate shock. And then um, on the commercial side, again, and it's caused issues with valuations and, and kind of gummed up the works. But some of what our uh, our speakers, other speakers, particularly those focused on the commercial side, have noted is that you're starting to see that gulf, that gap, whatever you want to call it, between sellers who don't want to sell and buyers that want to start looking for opportunity uh, narrow. So I think that you know that. I look at this year as kind of a year where uh, we're going to unstuck parts of the market and we're going to see, you know, inventory start to pick up. And we're also going to see stubborn sellers and kind of uh, more acquisitive buyers find a, uh, find a middle ground. Mm, that makes sense. Um, so 
Do you, are you concerned at all about the banking sector, given that, uh, you know, a lot of these commercial loans are going to be coming due? Yeah, you know, it's great that you bring that up, too, because you, you see all these headlines. If you're if you're somebody who's not involved in real estate, you just read the Wall Street Journal websites, whatever, you know, you see a lot of doom and gloom kind of stuff out there. And and, and that's not to say there aren't banks that are, are exposed to this. I mean, Mitch Rochelle is one of the gentlemen that, that uh, has spoken at a couple of conferences and has talked about this. I mean, he, he's got his hands dirty in that sort of realm. And yes, there are banks that are going to have issues. There's banks that we know have already failed. Um, but this, to me, does not look like the kind of, you know, widespread, systematic, uh, really, you know, waterfall kind of selling, failing type environment that we had back in the credit crisis, right? I mean, a lot of that mortgage risk on the commercial and residential side there was just spread throughout the system. Everybody w- was overloaded with this stuff. And once the, the credit market started to shut down, the economy shut down, um, you know, all of it came, came crashing down. I don't see this as an environment similar to that. I think, you know, it's more institution specific. It's more location specific. And it, Unlike, I think, back in that last cycle where you had some of the, the paper that was that, that was in the system was basically designed to fail from, from scratch and was almost going to fail even if rates didn't go anywhere, these exploding arms and all that stuff that was going on. Uh, it's a different kind of lending environment, different protocols, more restrictive banks and so on, uh, even during the better times. So I think it's going to be, if anything, kind of a, a slow unwind process with occasional bouts of, of uh, short-term chaos like we saw back in early 2023. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people waiting for that shoe to drop, and it just hasn't, like you said. <laughs> Again, you know, if you go back to 05, 06, 04, 07, that period, I mean, you know, you look at just the structure of some of the more residential mortgages being written, you know, these 228s and 327s and, you know, IO type loans that are just set up that even if rates don't go anywhere, the borrowers, borrowers were going to face these huge spikes they couldn't refi their way out of. And, and you know, it, the paper itself and the structure of the lending was just such junk that that's why I think a lot of people got into trouble, especially when you layered rising rates on top of that. Whereas this time around, it's been a different sort of uh, lending and investing environment, in my opinion. And so I think that you don't have those catalysts for just, uh, again, for everybody to panic. It's more, you know, property specific, subsector specific, location and institution specific. Well, if, again, if you were going to look at something that could be a, <clears throat> a thorn in the, <laughs> you know, in the U.S. economy, um, it could be the deficit or the debt. Um, i We've already been our credit's been downgraded because of the uh, because of that. Yeah. Do you see that turning around? Like, can politicians stop spending? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's crazy because obviously everybody that, that you speak to, or you know, you and I, we have our own personal political beliefs. But when you try and put your economics hat on it or markets hat and just say, okay, forget my personal politics, what do I think is going to happen? It doesn't seem like really either party or you, you know has this sort of plan or, or, or focus or whatever you want to call it on really tackling deficits, really tackling spending. It's just a case of. Who, do, who are their least favorite people they want to tax more and who are their most favorite people they want to give more breaks to um, and the invari- you know inevitable kind of consequences the debt load just keeps going up um, that can go on for a long time I mean it has you know we've had these periodic shocks obviously what was it back in 2011 with the debt downgrade and the markets you know had that short-term swoon on that um, but how many years and how many trillions of dollars of debt ago was that that we had the downgrade right uh, and yet here we are still I think it's going to be one of those things where you are seeing some pressure from markets I mean if you look at what's happening at the long end of the yield curve uh, you look at some of the bond sales the government's had to do later it's a lot of supply. It's hitting the markets, uh, you know, in waves. And I think that's probably part of why we've seen long-term interest rates going up. So, again, I don't really see sort of an acute type trigger, the kind of thing that, that you had with, with housing finance in the mid-2000s. Um, but it's going to be one of those long-term things that in the, unless the markets, uh, especially international debt holders, are convinced we have a, a plan or some kind of, uh, you know, way to deal with all this, it will all else being equal, forget economics, inflation, whatever – it would help to keep interest rates higher than they might otherwise be. Well, hopefully we can grow ourselves out of it. Um, and maybe at the, at the same time, cut cut some expenses. Uh, we shall see. That's probably yeah. not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Very doubtful. Mm-hmm. Okay. So any last thing, like why should people go to the money show? What, 
what are they going to learn? Well, I'll tell you, Kathy, I mean, you know, given your background and, and the fact that you deal with individuals who are investing in real estate that are, you know, putting dollars at work, I'm excited. Our whole team's excited. You're going to be there. I think it's going to give some great insights on, on, you know, actionable, practical advice for people that are looking to put money to work in real estate. So they're going to get that uh, here from you. We're going to have a chance to have a great panel where we, you and me and John uh, kick around some ideas about, about some of the things we're talking about here, what's going to happen with mortgage rates and different parts of the real estate industry that might be more uh, problematic versus more, you know, have potential opportunities. So uh, it's going to be a great opportunity. It's designed for individual investors. It's designed for high net worth investors who are, who are looking to put money to work. So uh, we're looking for a great show again, to be back in the Bay area. I mean, it, it's funny the last year before um, the pandemic, I, I w- was able to rent a bike uh, in North San Francisco, a bike across the golden gate bridge all the way to Tiburon and take a ferry back. And it was probably the, a, a great day trip that I did after all the work part was done. So I'm looking forward to being back in the Bay Area for sure. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. My grandmother grew up there. She was famous for, I don't think I've ever said this before, but um, she she would swim. She was a competitive swimmer and would swim around Alcatraz when it was prison. <laughs> wow. The, wow. And the guards would come out with their guns because they thought she was an escaped <laughs> you know, prisoner. And she'd be like, no, no, no. And then, oh, it's just Jackie. Um, wow, that's... So uh... <laughs> she must have been. She must have been in, in really, really good shape. That's all I can say for that kind of swim. She was in very good shape. There was another time when the crowd. She was famous, so the the crowds would come and and uh, one time they were waving at her and she was like waving back and they kept waving more frantically and she'd wave back and and then finally she's like, "Wow, I have so many fans today!" And then she looks and there's a shark just swimming around her. Ay ay ay. Anyway, that was probably the fastest she ever swam. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever it takes to get motivated to beat your personal time, right? Right. (laughs) All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much for being on The Real Well Show. I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Awesome. Glad to see you soon. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Well Show. If you'd like to find out about our upcoming live event on May 4th, you can do that at realwealthshow.com. It's also in the San Francisco Bay Area. We'll be featuring five teams from different markets around the country who can share with you the kind of investments that they can provide you with property management in place. I'll be giving my 2024 housing forecast to where we're headed for the next six months. And I'll also be going over our most recent syndication. Again, that's May 4th. You can just go to realwealthshow.com, click on the learn tab. And then maybe I'll see you at that or the money show just a few days later. Either way, I look forward to seeing you again here on The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.